But on the topic of booking jobbers, you know, Jay Strongbow did that for years. I think Arnold Skolan did it. A lot of guys did it also depending on the town they were in. But in, I think, 91 is when you had the Chuck Austin incident in Florida where Marty Jannetty gave Chuck Austin the rocker dropper. This guy, with all due respect to him, should not have been in that ring. He should not have been working, taking that spot. He didn't know how to take what was really a simple bump, and he broke his neck. And then, of course, you have the hard and and, and and let me And let me, let, let me chime in on that also. They, I don't know what would possess somebody that didn't know what they were doing to take the kind of bump he took. Cause I know for a fact that they had at least explained it to him. So I, it, it was just, there's no way in the world that, 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 that he should have been on that show or in that ring. And, and still it was stupid. <laughs> so it was yeah. a combination of the two. It was, it was their fault for putting him on TV. And then he was rotten. Uh, on top of that, let's just say that. But there have been lots of unqualified underneath guys on TV. And of course, we talked about the Hardys. They were working underage on this national television broadcast. But when you took over and you started booking guys for those tapings, what was your process? How did you check age? How did you check in terms of what they did? Like, what would you go through to make sure that you weren't going to put anyone out there that would embarrass you? Well, I... <sighs> In many cases, I had seen the person before in person, or I had seen tape, uh, and there was there was usually not a question of whether they were eighteen years old or not, because I didn't at the time. I can't. I can think of. I can't think of anybody besides the Hardys, to be honest with you, that I had seen that was still at Chris Candido. There were very few people I saw that were still teenagers and I would say needed to be on WWF television, even in the category of a, of a job guy. Um, I, so I just, I took it a little bit more seriously. So I'd either seen these guys in person or I'd seen the tape or in a couple of cases, people that I respected would say, Hey, I got this guy. He's doing well. Uh, do you have, and then I wouldn't figure him into anything that anybody need to be figured into. Uh, or, or put him in a general pool until we just saw him in person and knew that he got there. But it, it just, it wasn't that hard. Cause if I watched a few tapes. I'd just actually come from running my own promotion. So I at least knew who people in the fucking the South and the Southeast and mid Atlantic were, but I knew other promoters and uh, I knew what was going on in the business. So I wasn't just going to, you, we had to get people. We couldn't fly job guys. We had, they had to drive, live in the areas, and we would generally need six or eight or whatever it was just to make sure, or for the dark matches or extra stuff or whatever. But I wasn't just going to say, "Hey, <laughs> hey, Bill in Kansas City, bring six fucking guys do this national television." I felt like at least we had no, had to have enough goddamn due diligence to know who the fuck they were and if they knew what they were doing. So I would always call guys individually. You knew a lot of the guys. I remember when you would do stuff with Dennis, you would end up hooking up a lot of those guys with underneath gigs or extra gigs on tapings. I remember, I think Derek well, Domino we, and Harley Lewis, you gave a chance to at one point. Uh, yeah, well, yeah. And, and Devin Storm and a Starling, uh, and Devin Storm Crowbar, who uh, still works today. And, uh, you know, but, um, it, guys who stood out on independent shows in the particular area, I like I said, I and I did some pretty much in this half of the country, and then I had uh, tapes from the West Coast, and that's when I'd seen uh, Vic Grimes and and Aaron O'Grady that became Crash Holly, and uh, I think Roland Alexander got hot at me because I gave them a tryout match when we went out there instead of uh, against each other so they could do all their shit because it, it was cool shit uh, over Michael Modest and Donovan Morgan that he was pushing because they were the guys running his school and I and Michael Modest and Donovan Morgan were great guys too but they had they had already been seen I wanted these new guys to be seen and they got a job off that uh, so it wasn't hard to keep up with who was standing out on independent shows at that time, because there weren't that many independent shows because there was halfway, almost still a framework of a wrestling business. Uh, but I digress. You were giving lots of guys, opportunities, guys that you knew, you know, at least somewhat. Did anyone ever really piss you off or embarrass you once you gave them that opportunity? Oh, fuck. Um, that's a horrible question. Cause I don't really have an answer. I can't remember anybody that, that just embarrassed. Uh, well, maybe I can, but I can't tell that story. 
Um, <laughs> and but I, I can tell you, somebody I felt bad for. Will that do? Because uh, they yeah. fucked up against their will. Doug Basham, who I, I who worked here in OVW forever, and unfortunately. You know, it was managed by Linda Miles in the worst tag team gimmick in recorded history, and it killed both him and the damages f- career, his fucking brother, Danny. Uh, Doug Basham uh, had a shot in TNA and had come in and it worked a couple matches, and, and Damage at that point, uh, he just he never really worked again. He just it was mentally broken from his time in the WWF uh, and just gave up the fucking business completely. Uh, so Doug gets a chance as a single and he was ripped and he was in good shape and he was a possibly technically one of the best worker, if not the best worker that OVW produced in all those years. Uh, I think he was for the whole package of thing. He was better than Norton um, as far as execution in the ring and timing and shit. I just loved his work. He was the Brad Armstrong of OVW. So he's got a, a singles dark match so they can take a look at him. <laughs> and boom, in the first 90 seconds went wonderful, right? And I'm pulling for him. I'm like, go, Doug. Y'all, you're going to tear the fucking place apart. And at that point, the fucking baby face goes to slam him and he fucking flies over the top and drops behind, goes for a roll up. The baby face drops flat. Doug goes to take the flying bump through over the second rope. So the baby face can do his dive or whatever the fuck. It's going to be just this great fucking spot. When he goes for the roll up, the baby face drops flat. Doug flies out and it's a goddamn six sided ring which he's been in a total of now three times in his life. And I hated that fucking thing. Now that I find out I don't have a dog in this fight, I can say I hated that fucking six sided ring. <laughs> Fuck that goddamn thing. It sucked. And because the, the steps are at a different place, he flies out and lands head first on the metal fucking steps. You hear Ooh. it. Bam. Throughout the arena. And it's the only legit knockout finish I have seen in the past 25 years. Wow. That was it. Boom. He didn't come back yet. He didn't get up. We had to go carry him out. And that was his fucking tryout. And and he <laughs> shortly after he gave up the business that he hadn't worked in. <laughs> and so that was but they oh they were fucking great until they they well, Johnny Jeter quit the business after working for the WWF and being in the spirit squad. He moved back to San Diego and actually is successful now as a, one of those physical trainer therapist uh, people with a, a wonderful family. Um, maybe it might be for the best, but I, the best talent that we trained at OVW all uh, retired after their run in the WWF. Almost all. I that is say. amazing. How many guys worked so hard for that opportunity, got it, and then said, I want nothing to do with this ever again and walked yeah. <laughs> Put it behind me. It doesn't happen. No one says I worked my whole life to be a baseball player. I've gotten to the major leagues. You know what? I hate this. I quit. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't happen anywhere else. It only we happens. ought to go back and count that sometime just to see. Jeez. Just, I've, I've, but it's nevertheless a topic for another time. <laughs> 